Hello, my fellow music lovers. I'm Alison Hagendorf, and welcome to the show. This is where we celebrate the universal love of music and the rock and roll spirit that lives in each of us. My guest today is Duran Duran bassist John Taylor. We talk all about the band's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, their current nationwide tour with the legendary Nile Rodgers and Chic, how Duran Duran got their quintessential 80s style, and the story behind how a serial kidnapper used their music to brainwash his victims. This is for all my fellow true crime fans out there. And stay tuned after the interview for my sound advice. New music you need to know. It all starts now. Well, I'm so glad I'm seeing you. The last time I saw you was the Hollywood High premiere at the Dolby. I was so honored to be part of that. That was such a fun night. Mm. And to be able to see your fans so up close (laughs) and devoted and loyal. I mean, you literally have the most loyal fans. They're beautiful. They really are. And, And so supportive. I mean, I actually love doing those kinds of fan events where you, you know, where we're on the stage and we've got the mic. Yes. Uh, and, you know, you can really have fun. You it know, you can really fun. have fun with them, actually. I love making them laugh. They love it. I mean, that was such a fun night for me to see the fans. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction was such a monumental night for many reasons. Um, I feel like you got a little emotional during the acceptance. How did that feel for you? What was that night like? Well, you know, obviously, it's 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 amazing to be part of something like that where... I mean, I think you're always, I think all of us that do what we do, we're always thinking, do I fit in? You know, typically the kind of people that get drawn into this world that want to be musicians or, you know, rock and rollers, you know, are like outsiders typically. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they don't, you know, we find this because we don't really fit in at school or, you know, so we're kind of outsiders. You know, Duran are great because we're a band. So wherever we go, we're kind of, we've got our own little posse. Um, but then you go to something like that and you see all these other little posses. You see Bruce's yeah. posse and you see Eminem's posse and you see Annie's posse. And and it's fantastic. And and actually, I did like the way they put it all together. I thought as a showcase, I mean, listen, you're, ta- you're taking, you know, platinum artists and you're sort of like, you're sort of distilling them down to 10 minutes. Right. You know, they, well, I guess it's about 15 minutes, actually. You've got this little, you've got an induction speech, you've got a, a, li- a little video, you know, behind, six minute behind the music and then, a you know, a 10 minute segue. Mm-hmm. And I mean, who doesn't shine? I mean, my wife couldn't stop talking about the Scorpions. Not the Scorpions, Judas Priest. Judas Priest, I mean, yeah. she couldn't, she's like, who are, what is this? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, you know I it, love was, that. It, it was like, I was like, well, uh, back in the uh, late 70s, <laughs> um, you'd have gu- dual guitar bands and, you know, and uh, it, no, I mean, it was, it was just, uh, no, there was something for everyone and, um, and yet it all kind of, it was all copacetic. It was yeah. Great. It, was a, it was a special night. It was a special thing to experience and, and to watch. And you guys had the most landmark year last year. I mean, mm. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame was just one of the things. You, you played London's Hyde Park. You had the Queen's Platinum Jubilee at Buckingham Palace. You had the North American tour, sold out shows at the Garden, three nights at Hollywood Bowl. I mean, how does it feel to be making such a powerful impact for decades? into it. Yeah. Well, I think to some extent, it's just about staying together. You know, I mean, I mean, you become a, I mean, in a way you become a North star to people. I, I, I think when you, when you can stay together, um, because there's so much <laughs> uncertainty, I mean, you know, who knows what's, who knows what's going to happen? You know, it's, 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 there's something comforting, um, about, you know, a group particularly, you know, of guys or whatever that choose to stay together and choose to keep keep working in a creative way. So, yes, I mean, you know, obviously that it starts with the fans that, you know, were with us from the 80s. Um, and then, you know, right up to more recently, get, you know, getting the respect of people, you know, that run the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, and, and just people saying, wow, you know, these guys, you know, they're, they're worthy of our attention. And, um, yeah, I, 
I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I just think, I, th I think in our business, particularly with bands, um, it's very hard to keep bands together. Very hard. And frankly, the way that the, the industry has gone in the last 20 years, really, it's not, it's not band centric. You know, it, yeah. it likes individuals. It, it wants to, it, they're cheaper to run, easier to manipulate, you know, and, and it's just, it, it, you know, and, and so I think, I mean, I think there are so many bands that broke up early. You know, I look at that. I mean, I was watching the Beatles Get Back documentary yes. and I was just, oh man, you know, I mean, they could have, you know, we could have had five more albums out of them, know. you know, and maybe 15 less solo albums. You know, and uh, I, I don't know, you know, and they were, I mean, obviously nobody can imagine what they had been through, but uh, also we have today, you know, we're, this is the longevity generation, isn't it? You know, we've got so many strategies to sort of keep ourselves together, you know, individually and collectively. So it, it, it's kind of easier. What is the Duran Duran superpower that keeps you guys together <sighs> and so prolific? We're very competitive with each other, you know. So it's like, you know, we tend to, you know, sort of play these games with each other about, you know, oh, you're going to do, you know, I'm going to raise you. Right. You know, I'm going to raise you creatively. I'm going to raise you energetically. I'm going to raise you sartorially. It's like you know? that brotherly love. I love that. It's like, yeah. a, comp it's like a healthy competition. I yes, like that. yes. I mean, it really is. And that's, 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 that's the dynamic that exists within the band. And, you know, and uh, I mean, it was enormously powerful when we, when we first started because none of us knew what we were doing at all. But I mean, at the same time, we all knew what we were doing. But, uh, but everybody had, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about um, social media recently and um, thinking about that act of posting, you know, uh, like you go, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, whether you're, whether you're, whether you're working or whether you're going to a restaurant or whether you're, whatever you're doing, you know, and you get home and you post your experience, you know. And I was thinking about like in the early years of the band, I mean, Nick and I, we grew up on the same, we grew up on the same, you know. You were neighbors. Yeah. In the, in, the, in the suburbs of Birmingham. And, 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 you know, we'd take the bus into the city and we'd meet the guys and we'd practice and then we'd hang out, have a few drinks at the club and then, and then we'd go home, you know. And, and, and we used to have this walk from, from where the bus dropped us off. We'd walk for about 20 minutes, you know. And, and it, in a way, like the whole MO of the band was determined on that journey, you know, night after night after night when we'd be coming home and we both had so much enthusiasm for what we were doing and, and, and we would plot where we, where we were going. And I was just thinking how different it would have been had we said, hey, you know, see you tomorrow. And then we go to our respective homes and then we get home and then we both post yeah. individually the experience, you know, and, you know, that never happened, you know, with, with us. We were, it was always a collective collective experience and the, and the experience moved forward and grew collectively. Right. It wasn't like anybody was... I mean, as you start getting in the public eye and you start doing interviews separately, then you kind of you kind of separate. But in that initial those initial times, it's it's a purely collective experience, right. and you're growing together. That's interesting. So I'm always thinking about how social media is going to affect the younger generation. And you're right; you it does take away some of the art and some of the organic. Like you said, the the bonding and the camaraderie, because everyone's already thinking about what am I posting later, as mm. opposed to just being in the moment together. Mm. That's interesting. And you're right, it is harder for bands to to stay together. Mm. Yeah, well, you guys are very unique. And I, I cannot believe that you and Nick grew up together. Yeah. What was that initial connection between you guys? Were you listening to the same music or what was yeah. it that connected you? We had a friend, mutual friend. Uh, Nick and I didn't go to the same school, but, but I had a friend who went to Nick's school and uh, he introduced us. And funnily enough, we bonded over, we were both... It was like we were both Bowie fans, but more than Bowie, we were both into Mick Ronson. And Mick right. was Bowie's guitar player, mm -hmm. but he was more than that. Mick was like a, 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 an extraordinary architect of sound and melody and everything that he played on Ziggy Stardust and Aladdin Sane and Transformer. I mean, he was the guy that came up with the All the Young Dudes riff. You know, he brought so much to, to David's musical world. 
And Nick, Nick and I were kind of more into Mick than we were That's to David because we were snot, because we were elitists, <laughs> but, but also because we could see the power behind the throne, you know. And I think that, you know, that was not insignificant in, in the, how we, we developed as when we started thinking of ourselves as creators. Right. And musicians, because we, we, you know, we, for, it was, you know, we hung out for a few years, you know, and we would go to see, you know, we were into Queen and Roxy and you know, all of that Genesis we liked, and and it wasn't, we never really thought of ourselves as musicians. Neither, of, you know, there were no musical instruments in our homes growing up. Our parents didn't have, neither of our parents had that kind of, you know, they would never have thought, oh, you know, we must give Nick or. Nigel, you know, <laughs> piano lessons. Yeah. It never would have crossed their minds, you know. But then punk rock came along and that was like, mm. <laughs> Is that where it changed yeah, for you? Yeah, and that's where definitely. you're like, I must play. Yeah. Who was it? What was it? What was the, the impetus for this change? Uh, well, I mean, the, the record that tipped the balance was Anarchy in the UK, yeah. you know, right. because that was just, I mean, we, we started reading about punk and it looked really fantastic. It, it, it took a little while to sort of make its way up to Birmingham, um, and I—I I don't know. It, it it just started intriguing me. It just I started seeing pictures of of, of the bands, like the Clash, and oh, I love the way they were dressed. Yes, and, you know, and and um, but I didn't know what they sounded like, and um, I think I, I forget what the first. I think New Rose by the Damned was the first sort of punk forty-five, as we called it, I th and then I think the Buzzcocks put something out, and then the Clash's first song came out, uh -huh. White Riot, which actually wasn't all that good. I mean, their first their first album isn't that great. They hadn't found their drummer There's, yet. Right. It's kind of kind of it's a bit flat. But when the Fist Pistols finally put out their first record, it was it was like mind blowing, monster. Can't yeah. even imagine. I mean, it's still got to be, I think, one of the five greatest song rock rock songs of all time. Yeah. It's just an anthem, a timeless yeah. anthem. Yeah. Style and aesthetic was yeah. so important at that time mm. and for you and has mm. always been important for you. When did Nigel become John? <laughs> I feel like you had your own personal transformation, right? Yeah. Uh, well, What triggered that? Well, I mean, I generally, I think all the, mu the music that I've always liked was always dressed. You know, there was always a look. Yes. You know, even if it was the Beatles in their suits. Of course. You know, in their Cuban heel boots. You know, they always looked different to everybody that was around them. You know, and then Stones, obviously, and then Bowie and Freddie and, you know, and it was like an in the, an Elton, you know, yeah. I mean, the 70s was insane. It was such a competitive time. I mean, the quality of music that was being produced was just off the charts, right. I think, you know, and, and, and so... No, not only did you have to be as talented a writer, singer, performer as Elton John or Freddie Mercury, you had to have an extraordinary look right. to get everybody's attention. And um, so, you know, clothes were, you know, <laughs> I mean, it had to be dressed. And, the, and then the pistols came along and, you know, and, and, and the clothes that they were wearing before they even had a record deal were, we now know, some of the greatest clothes that had been designed by Vivian Westwood, you know, in, 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 in the 20th century, you know, right. so, um, and then The Clash, who they had to do a DIY thing because they mm -hmm. didn't have Vivian Westwood. Vivian. <laughs> so they, they did this whole Jackson Pollock thing and they were like splattering their, their shirts with paint and, and, and stenciling on them. It was real DIY art school stuff, which I loved. and. Um, so, so then, then we're sort of entering this post-punk phase and Nick and I are sort of like Duran Duran is starting to move and we're sort of thinking about, and then Gary Newman comes along yeah. and it's got this very kind of formal, almost like a sci-fi look to it. Mm -hmm. These kinds of like silky tunics that are like with asymmetrical zips going up them and we kind of like that. Yeah. You just know you've got to be different. You know, you've just got to find, you know, I mean, like the freaking pixie boots, you know, like yeah. Duran had these, we all, we all had these like suede booties and <laughs> the then I booties. started rolling up my sleeves and, and stuff. And it's, and it's just like, you're just, you're just trying to, um, 
you're just trying to find ways to stand out, you know. And um, and then within the band, it like you start bouncing off each other. And, so good. You know, it was like this new fun. romantic sort of vibe that was happening. Yeah, I mean that was um, you know Adam Ant who'd come along and he'd done the he was doing uh, the whole swashbuckling thing and the yeah. sashes and the headbands and and ruffles. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> such a great time. What about, you know, Duran Duran's like the album cover art and then, of course, mm. treatments and stuff for the videos, which were was so essential. How, how did the artwork come about? How did all that aesthetic come um, to fruition? Well, you know, when you when you get a record deal, you know, suddenly you've got like a marketing department and you've got people sort of strategizing on your behalf. And um, so Malcolm, they, Malcolm Garrett was brought in. He was a Mancunian. He had a company called The Sorted images and he had done all the buzzcocks right uh and magazine artwork which was very stylized and um so he got to you know define our sort of graphic the band's graphic sensibility i mean photographers we were doing a, so many photo sessions like from from the moment we signed a deal really i mean we were just we were a very photogenic band, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we would be doing, oh my God, I mean, we would do, we would go down to London and we would do like four or five photo sessions, you know, in a day, you know, and we'd be, wow. we'd be servicing like Japanese, the Japanese yeah. magazines, the German magazines, you know, this, that, and the other, you know, and all the pop magazines, because there was a, right there, there was a shift. Um, and it was kind of, it kind of moved away from, you know, I would say the more, kind of intellectual sort of post-punk music into this pop. There was mm -hmm. this new pop movement. Right. ABC, uh, Adam Ant, Hercom yes. 100, you know, and suddenly it was like Human League. It was like everything, everybody was trying to look glamorous and, uh, and it was all color. It was color. Yeah. And um, so, God, you, you needed so many clothes. <laughs> so many clothes. <laughs> you know, because every time you did a photo session, you needed a, you needed a new look, which was, yeah. which was awful, of course. You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, the, the planets were aligned because then, of course, it was the launch of MTV. Mm. And you guys were the video pioneers. You really were. And Rio was on rotation 24-7. I remember seeing it. That's sort of what catapulted you into being a household name. Mm -hmm. And that's when it was like the hysteria, like Beatlemania for mm -hmm. Duran Duran, especially in the US as well. Do you re recall that ascent or was it just all a whirlwind? Do you remember like how it snapped? I mean, the first album did pretty well. Right. You know, and, 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 and the music of the first album did precede us. You know, I mean, we, we got to New York and... You know, people, everybody knew Planet Earth, everybody knew Girls on Film. Yes. You know, we had fans uh, already. And, um, you know, the videos, I mean, none of us really saw that coming, to be honest. That was, that was, uh, that was the X factor. You know, that's the thing that you, you, you know, you plan, you get all your ducks, you get everything in a row and like, and then you have, you, you have some luck and fate plays a, plays a part, you know, and suddenly we're like, wow, we're the most perfect band for the video age, you know. And um, so after the success of the first album, we, we've, just, we've just put the Rio album to bed and, and everybody's thrilled with it. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, it was, I mean, it was everything, awesome. that, that album. And, um, and the manager just came up with this idea that we would go to, uh, we, would, we were flying to, from London to Australia to start a tour there and we'd stop off in Sri Lanka and do some videos. I mean, how <laughs> off the wall is that? I mean, we're like, what? You know, but we're also like tired, exhausted and yeah. addled. We'll go anywhere. Um, but we had a relationship with, uh, with uh, Russell Mulcahy, who directed a number of our videos at that point. And so we trusted him and we just went with it, you know. And, uh, and Simon was like awesome. You know, he was, mm -hmm. he really, he really stood out in that era, I think. You yes. know, he'd been, you know, he'd been, um, he'd studied, he'd been an actor from yeah. an early age, you know, he'd done, commercials and he'd done drama and he'd done Shakespeare and he wasn't afraid of doing Indiana Jones, you know, yeah. I mean, he just fucking so went for great. it and, um, and he gave it credibility. Yeah. You know, he really looked like, I mean, the rest of us didn't know what the hell we were just like, <laughs> can't we be in this shot? But, si <laughs> but Simon really, 
he really carried those videos. It was so perfect. And like you said, you guys had already laid the foundation with the first album and you had this drive and this ambition. You set out to play Madison Square Garden. You did. And it was only in a, a number of, what, four years? Mm, did you realize that. at the time that you would not only be playing it within four years, but in 40 years, you'd be playing in the oh, garden? I, I mean, that's pretty like that. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you got to have you got to have goals, haven't you? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but what was the drive of the band? Like you guys were committed to be the biggest band. Well, I don't know whether I thought about being the biggest band, but I, I definitely thought, I mean, I think it was, we were just products of the time and, you know, and punk rock just cracked, it cracked it open. And, um, you know, you just didn't need, you know, you didn't need the, what is it? The 10,000 hours. Right. You just didn't right. need it in that moment. You just needed the right haircut the right attitude, you know, the, just, the, the, it was, I don't know, it was a time where actually those 20,000 hours worked against you. Right. It was more about, I mean, you get it now in a way, you know, it's like, it's like for every, for everybody that gets there because they've done the work, you know, the kids want somebody that just gets there like that, yes. you know, and they can own them. Right. You know, um, you know, the younger generation, they don't they want somebody that is theirs. And that means somebody that is new. And, um, you know, and it just I don't know, it just just sort of fell into place. I mean, it was crazy. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> it was. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, you know, we were just we were students of the of the whole thing, you know, and it's like you've got to have. Uh, You've got to have objectives. Mm -hmm. You do, you do, and um, you know you got to you got to do a lot of things to get there. But we had a very strong team. That's the thing about Duran, and and I mean I talked to so many people, young people, about you know what it takes, you know, and and most of the people that I talk to that are making music that want to be successful are doing it by themselves. Right. You know, maybe they're working with a producer, or maybe, but you know they're. And I'm just like, you've got to build a team. You've yeah. got to have a team. You can't do it by yourself. And it's even hard just to do it with one person. And at, at least with, I mean, Duran, we had a we had a team before there was anybody in addition to the band, you know, right. before you had managers and agents and lawyers and, and A&R men and ma marketing people, all of that. You know, you've got to build this huge team around right. you. And I think it's very, very difficult for, for an individual. You've got to be so focused. So focused. Oh God. Yeah. I cannot imagine what it was like for you guys on this ascent in the 80s. You were living in New York City at one point with Boy George. <laughs> as well, I wasn't living with Boy, but your we were. Neighbors. We were uh, <laughs> your neighbors. Your neighbors? Yeah, we were neighbors, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm sure that the debauchery was uh, mm. unparalleled. Yeah. Since then, you are now live a life of sobriety. I mean, it was lucky that I just got sort of, it was like, you know, the freeway off ramp just appeared, you know, and somebody said that way, mm -hmm. that way, you know. Um, but now I'm like, I get it. You know, everything, everything, everything happened to get me here in front of you this morning, Alison. Yeah. You know, and I, and, um, you know, it's funny like that. You know, you, I think, I think, oh, I mean, it, it's not easy staying, being sober is not easy either. You know, because you're always like, oh, you know, was it really that bad? And maybe I could just have one drink. And and besides, half the people in your life are like, you were so much more fun when you were drinking. Aww. You know, well, I, that's how it, I mean, that's how it is. You know, I think that's what works against. I think that's it, that's one of the reasons why it's quite difficult for people to keep it. You know, right? Um, um, but you know, I so I try to, I try to be really in the moment, and I try to, I work quite hard to feel really good about. The moment. Yeah. So then I can feel good about all those fucked up things that I did along the way. And now I'm like, oh, you know, all that happened for a reason. You needed to get all of that out of your system so you right. could get on with the next phase of your life. Of course. Um, and uh, it's a very energetic phase. Yeah. That's incredible and very inspiring. It's really amazing. Um, how do you stay so physically fit <laughs> and so uh, conditioned? I mean, because you're about to embark on a, mm -hmm. a new tour, yeah. which is so exciting, yeah. which is pretty grueling. You know, how do you get mentally and physically prepared for this? Firstly, we've done it before, so we, right. we kind of know what we're in for. Um, I think there's, you know, there's there's the playing, which you know you've you know you've got to have, 
you know, your playing game has got to be up. So that means practicing every day. Right. You know, whether you want to or not, which in my case is pretty much every day. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, yeah, then there's just the physical, you know, just making sure your body is up, is up for it. You know, it's, um, but I, I find like, as I get closer to it, I mean, I'm not typically like, a, I'm not really like an athletic person. I mean, I've never, I was never athletic as a kid. I'm not, you know, I have to push myself I say, into, into, yeah. into fitness. Um, but as it gets closer, I mean, it's just fear, really. You know, <laughs> it's just fear starts coming in. If you don't get on top of this, because there's just nothing worse than walking out on a stage and not and like not having the gas in the tank. It's I can't just imagine. horrible. Yeah. You know, I mean, like we I mean, I I live for gigging, you know. I mean, and you don't we don't do that much of it at the end of I mean, you call I mean, I th- I don't know how many shows we're gonna do this year, probably gonna do maybe maybe 50 at the most. It's amazing. Well, you know, but out of 300 and so many days, you know, and, and, and like you want that, that time on stage, you want it all to be, you want it all to be magic, you know, and, uh, you know, so you've got to bring, you've got to bring your game. Yeah. How symbolic that you're going to be touring with Niall Rogers and Chic. I mean, is that so full circle for you? Yeah, it is. And, um, but it's also very now, I mean, Niall is one of the most inspirational people in my life. He's one of the most inspirational musicians. The whole band are yeah, insane. insane. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's an example. I mean, the closer I get to the gig, you're rolling up to the gig and Sheik are playing and you're like, holy shit, I better get to that warm up room. You know, <laughs> I better get to that warm up room. I better play, you know, my scales or whatever it is I yeah. do from now until nine o'clock. <laughs> So one of one of your many legacies, of course, is a view to a kill, the James Bond theme um, from 1985. And it is the only James Bond theme to have reached number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and received a Golden Globe. Nomination. 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 Mm. But isn't that impressive? Oh, so I mean, impressive. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'm so impressed. But you made it happen, right? <laughs> because you were a James Bond fan. Like, how did that mm. whole, whole thing come about? Um, I, was at, uh, I was at a party. And... Uh, and um, I was introduced to Cubby Broccoli. It's amazing. And, uh, and you're like, now's my chance. Exactly. <laughs> I was like, when are you going to have? When are you going to have a decent theme song again? You know, I think I just had Rita Coolidge <laughs> doing Octopussy, and I was like, come on. <laughs> yeah, because you know, there's John Barry songs like Diamonds Are Forever and Golfing. It's like when you're growing up. You know, most British music fans of my my age, you know, we liked our Bowie and our Beatles and all of that, but we loved James Bond songs. Of course, they just I mean, what's like Goldfinger? Right. I mean, there's nothing like Goldfinger. You know, there's yeah. nothing like You Only Live Twice. They're kind of like, but now it's become, it's like a, it's like a, I think it's like the greatest song contest in music. Right. You know, uh, and I, because I love, it's like there's kind of these unwritten rules, you know, that it has to be dramatic. It has to be, cool but it has to be kind of sexy yes and it has to be modern ish you know and it has to have all these things and you know and if you listen to like the last 20 or 40 years of of artists who take it on yeah take on the 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 james bond theme song what they do with it i mean you know almost you know whether you're talking about you know shell crow or or you know billy or whomever it is it's like it's like the, one of the best things they ever did. Right. You know, it really brings out the best in people. And I love that kind of music anyway. I love songs like that. Yeah, I do you too. Know? Um, so it's always interesting to hear what people do um, when they get the chance to, to write a, a song for a James Bond film. Well, speaking of spies and secret agents, I think I shared you, with you last time about The Puppet Master on Netflix. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have to tell the story again for true crime fans because it's about this guy, David Hendy, who pretended to be an MI5 agent and he would kidnap people. And while they were in the car, he would play Ordinary World on a cassette tape over and over again, perhaps as part of this like brainwashing. (laughs) But not only did he play the song, you know, he specifically told everyone that he was related to you. Did he? (laughs) He specifically oh said. You see, you stick around long enough. To you. 
I'm so ultimately a serial killer will find a use for your music. <sighs> just, I'm sorry, but like while I was watching that, I was like, I wonder if John knows that he is uh, part of this entire that is news like, to me. Conspiracy. Okay. Mm. Outside of music, you have written a book, you've designed clothing, and now you have a signature base. This is exciting. So tell me about this. Yeah, I, I did do I did a signature base about 20 years ago. And, you know, and it was a very sort of a you know, it's a very affordable kind of item. This is a really sort of premier crew. Mm -hmm. um, the company that have been building bases for me, well, I, I, I say that like they're bespoke. I mean, <laughs> the companies that make the bases that I play, a uh, company out of Canada, they're called Dingwalls. And uh, I mean, they are, they're really, they're really beautiful instruments. And I, and I just was captivated by them from the, the moment that I first picked one up and played it. And I've been using them on stage. Uh, well, I actually, the last album, Future Past, was the first album that I, you know, the first recording sessions that I used them on. And then this, uh, you know, since then, the last couple of years, I've been using them on stage. So Sheldon Dingwall, who's the sort of the genius behind the, um, the instruments, um, the design, and the, he, he, he wanted, to, wanted to make a, a signature model with me. So we've Together, we've created the Rio Dream Bass. Oh, my God. And um, I mean, you know, it, uh, I mean, he has taken, he's done this, he's done this deal with uh, Rupert Neve, who is this genius electronics wizard uh, company out of Britain who built the, uh, all the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the desk, the recording desk and EQs that the Rio album was recorded on. I mean, it was really wow. the, particularly the late seventies, early eighties, it was the game. And I mean, if so many studios you go to will have Neve, either the desk will be Neve or they'll, they'll right. have Neve outboard gear or whatever. So they've built these electronics that go into the instrument. So it's so it's like you've kind of got that sound on tap. Oh wow, that's um, really cool. So that's different. Yeah. That's kind of that's that's kind of unusual and um you know and it's been styled in a in a very particular way and um What about colors? Yeah, it, co it comes in four colorways. The first colorway is is very is very much the the colorway of the the album cover. It's that kind of cherry red. Yeah. Um and um then the and that's a limited one, there's 82 of them. So that's a limited edition and it comes with all sorts of, you know, special case and all of that. And then there's, and then there are, there's a black one and a, a cream one and a, um, and a, a f sea foam sea green. Foam. Have which, to do sea foam. Which is my jam, personally. I can't wait. I was going to say, you have to. I can't wait to take that one on stage. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really fun to, um, and you know, right now we've been we've been having fun putting like marketing doodads together and so things that great. we're going to put on social media. Yeah, it, it, it's um, it's cool. That's really exciting. Congrats! That's awesome. Thanks. I can't wait to see the seafoam one. I'm all oh, about them. All about great. that one. You have done so much acting. You really have. Mm, I mean, is that something you'd want to continue no, to do? No? no, that's no. it. Been there, done that. Yeah, I mean, I'm just not. I'm not committed mm -hmm. to it. You know. I mean, you know. I mean, I I think that. Um, I mean, when you when you when you when you're famous, when you become famous for doing one thing, so many doors open to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, you've become a famous in music, so you know now. You know, people want to do a clothing line. They want you to design a car. They want you to, you know, and they offer you acting roles. You know, but I, I mean, I did I did a few things, and I I always have felt a bit of a fraud, quite honestly, because I'd be I'd be on the set and I'd be with with men and women who acting to them was what music was to right. me. Music always felt like my primary passion, you know, and it's the thing that I will, you know, that I will, you know, move heaven and earth to do well, yeah. you know, and, and, and I just felt like I was kind of slumming a little bit and I was, and I was there because, you know, because I, of, of who I was as a Duran Duran star, you know, and it just, it just didn't feel, uh, and it's, and again, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it is I hard. Mean, learning all those lines. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, my yeah. God. And, <laughs> and it's one of those, you know, I, 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 I just hadn't got it. I think it's one of those things like there are some things in life, like the earlier that you can start them, you know, the better. I just, I just didn't have that. I mean, I was, I was like the worst at learning lines, mm -hmm. you know. And actually saying like getting out on stage and realizing you've forgotten how the song goes. 
but also getting out on a getting out on a set, you know, and everybody's like uh, everything's ready to roll and action, and you've forgotten the lines. I mean, it was some of the most I've had. <laughs> it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, I had some <laughs> humiliating moments. Oh, no, that that's that's not something I'm looking to get back into. Okay, got it. Is there anything else you hope to achieve? No, I just I live day by day, you know, yeah. and I just I I, I just um. I'm all about relationships, you know, I just want to, you know, I just, I find that, uh, I mean, I'm looking at that, that image on the wall and yeah. it's all these intersecting lines and, and it's like, it's all about relationships, you know, I mean, connection is everything. Yes. It's the difference between a good day and a bad day, between a good year and a bad year. So, you know, I'm just like, all my energy goes into like having the best relationship with Nick, with Simon, with a manager with my wife, with my kids, you know, that's beautiful. it's just, that's, that's, beautiful. that's it. And then, you know, then the garden grows, you know, and, um, you know, that to me is like, I, and, and I've come to believe that that's the way, Yes. you know, rather than, rather than saying, well, what I want to do is this, you right. know, and I want to, and I want to get, there's this something I want, I, I, I don't think like that anymore. I just, I just think in terms of relationships and developing and working on my relationships, my friendships, and then just see where it goes, you know? And, you know, life's, and life is just by default, it becomes kind of interesting. I'm with you. What do you think is essential to build a relationship? What do you think is the sort of the foundation to a strong relationship? Well, I think tolerance, you know, and, um, and, and not always... And, and, you know, being able to, you know, having enough confidence to not needing to get your own way all the time. Right. You know, I used to, oh my God, I mean, I used, to, I mean, if you're, tr if you're trying to get your way, right. I mean, it's so exhausting. It's so exhausting. And then when you don't get your way, it's humiliating. <laughs> so you're almost right. better off going, hey, whatevs. Yeah. You know, whatever. Um, I'm good whichever way this goes. I mean, I've really learned that with the band because, you know, we've got, you know, I mean, everybody has equal say. That's four of us. Wendy, our manager, she has an equal say. If we're working on a record, we've got an engineer, we've got a producer. I mean, that's a lot of people, you know, whose, whose opinions are as important as mine, you know. So I've really got to be prepared to, to roll over a lot. Yeah. And um, and ditto at home and, you know, and, um, you know, I, and I think that kind of keeps me young as well. I, I think one of the things that kind of slows us down as we get older is that we get into this, like, I know what's best. Right. Father knows best. Yeah. You know, I know I've been doing this long enough, but I kind of like my, I like being open minded, you know, and um, maybe, and you know, and I know, you know. By experience that I don't always know what's best, you know. So being open to that idea, just letting that idea sort of sit there, um, you know, is great, you know, because I, I can still learn. Yes, it's, yeah. it's about learning. It's about checking your ego and learning and being yeah. open minded. Yeah, I was yeah. never good. I was a terrible student. You know, my dad was like, he was such an anti authoritarian. He hated anybody. He hated experts. He hated any. <laughs> and I kind of picked it up from him. Right. And so, but you know, the trouble with that is it's, you never learn anything because you've yeah. got to be the smartest guy in the room all the time. And like, I'm realizing like, well, you know, if you want to learn something, you've got to accept that, you know, this person knows more than you on this subject. And Yeah. You just got to let go a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We do this thing called deep cuts. It's just sort of like quick questions. Mm. Name a song, album, or artist that changed your life. It's got to be Bowie. And it's got to be, and I think Ziggy Stardust, because it's, um, it's just the most, it's a deeply moving, erotic record. And, you know, for me, for my 14-year-old self, it was, it was life-changing can only imagine what it was like at that time. What was your first concert? Mick Ronson. Oh my God. Yeah, he was, we talked about yeah. earlier. He was David Bowie's guitar player and, uh, and, and he went off and had a solo career, which didn't last very long. But um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and the fans went crazy and ripped out all the seats. And, 
It's <laughs> and, amazing. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, he he was great, man. What's a song that you wish you wrote? I don't know why I'm thinking of "Good Times" by Chic, but you know, but like as a bassist, you know, I think you're always looking for. I mean, notwithstanding everything I just said, you know, I'm always trying to bring as much bass to the music as possible, so that you can't really listen to the songs without being aware of the bass. Yes, you know. I, I've got that kind of a ba bass ego. And the the early Duran music, you know, had very prominent bass. Yes. And as the music sort of evolved into the 90s, you know, bass became a little bit less. But I'm always thinking about, like, how can I make the bass as cool and interesting without it getting in the way of whatever everybody else is doing? A song like Good Times, you know, you've got a vocal and you've got a bass. And that's all. That's it. So good. What is your favorite movie? I think the film that I go back to, oh God, probably North by Northwest, which was an Alfred Hitchcock film mm -hmm. with Cary Grant and it's sort of late fifties, very romantic, very worldly, very sophisticated. You know, it's a classic. <laughs> there's a, it's a line classic. where Cary Grant goes to the, he's at Grand Central Station in New York and he's on the run. He's on the lam. You know, everybody's looking for him. He's a wanted man. He's wearing these very cool sunglasses. And, um, and so he asks for a, for a, for a ticket to Chicago and the, and the guy on the desk says, what's wrong with your eyes, mister? You got a problem with your eyes? And Cary Grant says, yes, they're sensitive to questioning. <laughs> classic, classic. So good. Um, what is your favorite meal or cuisine? Oh, man. I mean, if I could eat pizza every day, I probably would. Uh, yeah. But I could say the same for sushi. <sighs> same. If you were not a musician, what would you be? I think I'd like to be a painter, actually. Really? <laughs> yes. Do you paint? I do. You do? Mm. That's amazing. That's, when, do you, when do you paint? Well, I really got into it during lockdown. I mean, I went to art college. And I did a bit of everything at art college. And, um, you know, I, I never would have thought of myself as, as going into painting, into fine art, into that pure expression. You know, I was thinking like, oh, you know, I'll go into graphics or I'll, I'll paint signs or paint vans or something like that. You know, yeah. something very like normal. And then I got into, then the band started rolling. And, um, and I've just become, I, I love I love fine art. I mean, Nick and I, we're just like, we're the biggest culture vultures. And whenever we're on the road, it's really like we're planning the gigs and we're planning the museums. And we love, love looking at painting. And um, it wasn't a Picasso purchased at some point. There was some sort of story where one, oh. there may have been an impromptu purchase. No. <laughs> I've Something got a, like that. I've got a, no, no. I feel like, I think maybe quite. Nick, I think it was by Nick. I you think he said it was a small one. It may be a small one. a very one. small one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Need and to I just, find out about that. I think really what, well, I mean, it's a great antidote to, um, to being in the band really, because as is such a collaborative medium and, uh, you know, I just started painting, 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 painting and realizing I didn't have to call anybody and say, Hey, is it okay if I use red? Right. How do you feel about this? You know? And Simon would say, I don't know. I, like, I think I like the green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's great to just be able to make all the de those decisions by yourself. And it was really empowering. I loved it. But, you know, I don't know whether, I mean, I don't know when I'll get back to it because it, lockdown was interesting. You know, I mean, I, I had a, I was so lucky, you know, because I didn't have to worry about putting food on the table and I could just uh, sort of, I, I, I didn't have kids that I was trying to educate, you know, I didn't have all those horrible problems that so many people had to deal with. I, you know, it wasn't the case for me. For me, it was just like, well, you just got to sit on your hands for until things change. And now I just started, I started getting into painting and oh my God, I went crazy. That's, a, I'd love I mean, to see I, some of your work. That's awesome. <laughs> I did so much. And um, it was real. I think, I feel like I did like, you know, a self-taught three-year degree course in that time. And, um, but, but like, I couldn't do it this afternoon right? because it was just, you know, there was, uh, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of listeners had, a, did have similar experiences just because we, there was nothing else to do. Right. It you was know? a mindset too. It was, there was, you know, I mean, there was, you know, so, so there was so much downtime. The phones weren't ringing. Nobody yeah. was doing anything. So, so there was all this available, there was all this energy available to do something. And, yeah. um, 
you know, I think, you know, some people, you know, they worked in their gardens and some people, you know, I mean, for people like myself that, that were fortunate enough to have the time and the resources, it was a very creative period. What a silver lining. That's beautiful. I'd yeah. love to see your work. I mm-hmm. might follow up on that. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a most prized possession? I have a library of art books that I began collecting when I was 15. And somehow I've managed to keep them all together. That is impressive. Um, because everything else, I've just like, I just don't know what happened. I didn't, I mean, Nick's kept everything. He has, Nick has held on to every single item he has, he has accrued since I first met him. You is know. he a hoarder? Oh, uh, <laughs> no, no. He's an archivist. There's a difference. He's you a know. historian. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but me, it. I mean, I lost every item of clothing. I lost every instrument I ever played. I mean, I, every car I ever owned. I mean, I just, so, but somehow the books I managed uh-huh. to keep. So, so I'm quite, you know, do I sound proud? I'm proud. It speaks volumes about you. Sorry. Ta-da. Okay. I had to. It's like dad jokes. I don't know. Are there words you live by? I mean, I, you know, we talked about that, didn't we? I mean, like, it's like, I don't always know what's best for me. And finally, what does rock and roll mean to you? Oh, man. Energy. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's our, when I say our, I guess I'm a, bo- I'm a boomer, you know, and, and, and it was the, you know, it was a, it, it was a, it's a revolution and it's, it, it was a young people's revolution and it was, and it kind of like, it defined the second half of the 20th century, I think. And it's a very empowering medium for, for young people and old people too, and <laughs> middle-aged people. For all of us. Yeah. I love it. John, thank you so much. What thank a delight you are. Thanks, Alice. I'm so psyched for this tour. It was such a treat to be able to sit down with John and hear his words of wisdom and his stories. I grew up glued to MTV, watching Duran Duran videos, and my sister definitely had a Trapper Keeper with John's photo on it from the 80s. Please know that these opportunities and these moments never get lost on me. It is now time for my sound advice. New music you need to know on the Allison Hagendorf Show playlist. First up is the latest from my friends in The Struts. The Struts are one of the best live bands, period. It's like they're from another decade of this larger-than-life arena rock performance. Luke Spiller is one of the most engaging and charismatic frontmen, channeling the greats like Mick and Freddie. They just announced their upcoming tour, so make sure you try and catch a show. Check out the latest from The Struts. Too good at raising hell. Next is the latest from English prog rock band Another Sky. Katrin's vocals are so unique and haunting. The band used to rehearse and perform in the dark just so they could get lost in and focus on the music. Their influences range from Radiohead to Joni Mitchell, and they have quickly become a new favorite of mine. Check out the latest from Another Sky, A Feeling. Also, my sound advice is another English band, Sundara Karma. I love these guys. I've been following them for a while. They just announced they have a tour and a new album on the horizon. This new song is a nod to the band's roots and is an instant feel-good song. Check out Sundara Karma's Friends of Mine. That's my sound advice this week. You can hear all of these plus more on the Allison Hagendorf Show playlist. The link to that's in the show notes and at allisonhagendorf.com. As always, thank you so much for being part of the Allison Hagendorf Show. New episodes drop every Friday, so make sure you follow and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. You can find the show wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can watch the show on Instagram and YouTube. I would love to hear from you, so please like, comment, rate, review, whatever you're feeling, and reach out to me on socials at Allie Hagendorf. I would love to connect with you. Let me know who I should interview next and what new music I should feature on my sound advice. Thanks again. I'll see you next week. And remember, you're a rock star. Listener.